Good evening to our Facebook viewers and welcome to the NICG Fireplace Conversation. Um, first discussion ever. Um, my name is Erin Stintuneko. I'll be the facilitator of the panel discussion this evening. Um, firstly, I would like to apologize to our online viewers for the late start. We're just experiencing some technical difficulties which we were able to, to rectify. Um, this evening, I'm joined by two esteemed experts on corporate governance, Mr. Steve Galloway and Mr. Esha Luanda. Um, welcome to the discussion. Thank you, Anstine. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Um, the NICG, which is the Namibia Institute for Corporate Governance, has started these fireplace conversations um, where it's a platform where we can discuss issues of corporate governance that are trending in our country, um, as well as a, a platform to educate the public on what is good governance. Um, by way of introducing my, my two panel members, I would like to do justice by reading their extensive bios so that um, members of the public, our Facebook viewers, can fully understand um, your, the extent of your experience and um, where, where you served. I'll start with um, Steve. Steve has over 40 years of working experience in the exploration, mining, government, investment, corporate and project finance, banking, strategic management, and has served on boards of several financial and mining companies. Steve retired in 2017 um, from banking, but he's still serving on certain, on, on a few governing bodies of various banking, ICT, tourism, environment, community, and governance organizations. He's the current um, chairperson of the Rossing Uranium a recent appointment, I hear. He's on, he also serves on the RMB Advisory Board since 2016. He's the director on the MTC Board, where he served on the Audit Committee, the CSI Committee, and he was also played the role of the Listing um, Committee Chair. Um, Mr. Galloway is also um, a chairperson of the Gondwana Holding Company. Other appointments, whether present or um, past, includes uh, B2 Gold Namibia, uh, on, he was, he's an honorary life member of the Namibia Chamber of Mines, founding member and director of Community Conservation Fund Namibia, executive committee member of the Namibia Chamber of Environment. Um, he served on the NIF um, panel, oh, sorry, um, committee and NIPA, and um, he's also chairperson of the Public Private Infrastructure Committee on Solutions to financing infrastructure and state assets, quite a mouthful. And um, he's also the director of the NICG since 2018, and also a member of the Working Committee on African Peer Review Mechanism. Once again, welcome, Steve, and, and thank you for agreeing to, um, to join our panel this evening. And moving on to Mr. Um, Luanda. Mr. Luanda is a, a governance and ethics um, executive in the retirement fund and financial services sector, having distinguished himself as one of Namibia's leading authority in corporate governance. He is a non-practicing legal practitioner with a right of audience in the High Court of Namibia. He's also a former deputy chief, he was also a former chief at the Namibia Law Commission. Mr. Luanda has amassed vast board experiences by advising, training, and consulting on boards in the private, public, and non-profit sector. He's advised over 50 boards in Namibia. Esha has served on the governing body of various entities, such as the Committee for Responsible Investing in South Africa, PRISA, the National Youth Service, Advisory Board of Business Ethics Network of Africa, the COSAFA Governance Committee, and is also a former independent and non-executive director of NEMFOR's Life Insurance. Uh, Mr. Escher is the founding, one of the founding directors of the NICG, where he served as the, as the chairperson, and he was the last per, chairperson of the N, of N Namibia. In terms of qualification, Mr. Luanda holds uh, a BURS, LLB, MBL, and postgraduate diplomas in compliance. He's a certified ethics officer and integrated reporting practitioner, accredited by the International Integrated Reporting Council. He's also a fellow of the Mauritius Institute of Directors. So that is Mr. 
Rwanda's um, biography. We, the, the NICG has started fireplace conversations, as I stated, um, with a view to really just um, provide a platform for discussions on various issues on governance. So over the next few weeks, you'll see um, we'll, we'll be hosting um, similar events where we'll invite various expert, experts uh, on various issues to discuss and really just um, educate the public. Um, before we, we dive into our topic for the evening, I would like to just ask Steve to um, give a brief um, background on the NICG and what it actually stands for. Mr. Good. Galloway. Thank you very much, Ernestine, and good evening, viewers. Um, NICG, it, in fact, was set up uh, in 2016 by the very Esho Luanda. He was the founder and he was the founding chairman. And it, it, it's an advocacy organization that really has become the custodian of corporate governance in Namibia. Even before it was institutionalized, which only has happened over the last six or nine months, it certainly became a very credible organization under Isha's leadership. And it typically partnered with organizations like the Africa Corporate Governance Network, the IFC, etc., and had a number of very credible meetings where experts from the region and global experts came in and, and told us about their experiences. And it was that setting up phase that really brought the corporate governance uh, tradition, if you like, and, and the best practice to Namibia. Uh, when we had the AGM last year, and Esha said he's, he's done enough and he wanted <laughs> to step down, I was very honored to be elected chairman then. And we immediately said we need to institutionalize the organization, NICG, because it's unfair and, and unsustainable to expect a couple of directors, uh, and especially the founding chair, to be able to sustain an organization like this into the future. So we employed three people. We have an executive director, Vincia Kluter, who's unfortunately not here tonight, but, but has set up these conversations. And we're really going to move in the next year to democratizing corporate governance. There is an understanding, a, a general sort of phobia, if you like, about corporate governance and a fear that it is all-encompassing and very bureaucratic and, and onerous. And we really want to bring the message to all organizations, all governing bodies of all organizations, that you can apply corporate governance appropriately and proportionately to any organization. It isn't onerous, it need not be, it need not be lots of compliance and tick boxes and so on. It can be an outcomes-based approach like King 4 and, and some other outcomes-based codes which any organization can apply to improve the efficiency of the organization and effectiveness of the organization. And, and improve the contribution to society. So that really is our mandate going forward, to democratize corporate governance and to bring it to all corners of Namibia and to all organizations in Namibia. Thank you, Steve. Now, um, let's dwell into our topic for the evening, which is titled, Does Governance Matter? So to kick off our discussion, I would like to just get your understanding, uh, Mr. Luanda, what is really corporate governance, especially for um, a person who's never heard the term and really just want to know what is, what is it all about? Uh, what can I say? Uh, and by the way, good uh, evening viewers, uh, Facebook viewers. Uh, corporate governance, um, let's maybe start with the more complex definition and uh, break it down to the much simpler one. Corporate governance, in my view, is the way entities are led and managed for the sustainable uh, benefit of the stakeholders. By this, putting it simplistically, it's about how we run organizations. Do we run them efficiently? Do we run them in a manner that they can derive value to the stakeholders, which is, say, the customers, the suppliers, the owners, the employees? If you do it well, then there's every chance that uh, you're doing your governance in the right manner. 
So I hope I've broken it down to a level that uh, it can be understood by many and all. Mm. Um, if I can move over to Steve, can you maybe just inform our viewers, what, what is the history of governance? Yeah, so governance in general is, is the overall concept of governing a country. And, and our sort of base on that is very sound in that we have in NDP5, we have a strong governance pillar in NDP5. The same has been carried through to the Harambe Prosperity Plan. So that's the governance, how you run the country, how you run institutions of the country. When we go down to what we call corporate governance, it's all organizations. It's, it's any, any organization at all that, that operates in, uh, in the commercial sector. It includes churches, schools, community trusts, conservancies, etc. And the reason why a lot of people are, are sort of averse to corporate governance is because they think it's this very sophisticated, uh, onerous, compliance-based governance. The history is exactly that. Cadbury codes are, were introduced in the UK about 40 years ago. And then we had a number of codes around the world, including the early King codes, King 1 and King 2, which were very compliance-based and, and seemed quite onerous and, and sometimes not relevant in all respects to the, to the corporations that we talk about. In the last few years, we've really adopted outcomes-based governance. And it's quite remarkable that it's in South Africa that this model of governance has developed and spread very quickly through Africa. And one of the tenets of the outcomes-based King 4 uh, code is what we call in Africa Ubuntu, the community involvement and the fact that corporates and all organizations become an integral part of the community. And it's literally that practice of stakeholder, what we call globally stakeholder inclusive governance that has taken hold right across the world. But it's come out of an African context of Ubuntu. And that's where we are now. We're in this triple bottom line, uh, if you like, uh, governance model, but it's outcomes based and it talks to the role of organizations in communities. And it, it, it's remarkable that it really has been led from Africa. Um, Esha, from the companies that you've led, either as chairperson or just as a, as a board member, mm. how, do you, how do you measure when you've actually achieved um, good governance? Um, good question. Um, governance, uh, and Steve has partially spoken to it. When you measure good governance, you need to look at the outcomes of how far you've gone. Um, it's very easy to have a very good set of rules, a very good set of procedures, practices, and compliance instruments. That's well and fine. That forms a very good basis. But if you cannot change the culture towards a culture of good governance, making sure that the organization is legitimate in the eyes of uh, those that it's meant to serve, that's the stakeholders. If um, you don't have an ethical culture, then you'll have a problem because you'll have a very good uh, annual report that says, I subscribe to code A, B, C, and D. But when people dig deeper, then your governance will be found wanting. When you look at organizations like your Steinoffs of this world, they had everything going. Enron was winning awards all over the show. But when you dug deeper, you had problems with um, uh, the underlying issues. So coming back to that, it needs to be a combination of having all the basics in place because that's what you need as a foundation and beyond that, inculcating a culture of effective and uh, ethical leadership which means leadership along values, um, seamlessly and effectively uh, executing your strategy, for instance, making sure that you have a, a good policy framework, mm -hmm. that you report in an integrated manner to your stakeholders, and the extent to which you able to be seen as a meaningful organization that can serve uh, your variety of stakeholders, be it the regulators, your customers, your, your service providers, and 
how responsive you are to the environment uh, that you need to make sure that it doesn't get degraded. So from that perspective, those are the pillars and the foundations of uh, uh, good governance for any organization. Mm. I can hear from what you were explaining that we've actually moved away from the just the, the pure profit focus kind of um, governance, which is very, very good. Um, maybe just moving on to, um, to Steve, um, in, the, in the setup or in the, in the governance of companies, we have board members, we have EXCO, and sometimes the, the, the roles of these two become very blur. Mm -hmm. Can you just share, us from, share with us from your experience, what is the role of the board and what is the role of, of the executive or the yeah, management of a, of a company? Yeah. So in any governance model, whether it be the sort of compliance tick box governance of uh, t 10, 20 years ago, or whether it be the outcomes based governance models, which is so much more applied to all, all life situations. In any of those models, there's a clear dif distinction between what the board does and what executive management does. The board has to be strategic. They have to look at all the factors that impact on a particular organization. So you need a diversity of skills, not that much specialist skills, although it's good to have some specialist skills. Uh, in, in the latest terminology, they're talking about T, T skills for boards. Mm -hmm. And that's broad skills across a lot of areas, but also some specialized skills. So that's the ideal, to have the sort of T, T skills. Um, and it's the combination of those skills on the board, the diversity of, of gender, age, skill diversity, etc., that makes that board strategic and makes that board uh, look into the future and see, see where the company should be moving. The board then forms the strategy, the mission, the vision, and it's the executive's job, it's the board's job, first of all, to appoint the executives. Mm. The, the CEO should not be appointed by shareholders. So it's the board's job to find that executive that's going to deliver their vision uh, and their strategy and the executive implement that strategy. So there's a very clear distinction. The executives are operational and execute on a strategy and have a lot of authority delegated mm -hmm. to them, the executives. But at no point should the executives be veering off into new directions which the board is not comfortable with because the board's got that collective wisdom mm. and fiduciary responsibility. The board are collectively responsible for, for the way the company goes. The CEO is similarly responsible and it's good practice more and more that the CEO must be part of the board. So King 4 recommends that at least two executives, typically the CEO and the finance, head of finance, become board members. So they are equally accountable uh, as, the, as the other board members, as the non-execs. But it's very good to have that integration of the non-execs and the execs. But the executive members of that board must remember that they are still executives uh, implementing the strategy which the board collectively has devised. Maybe just to expand on what you're explaining, um, maybe um, from, from Esha's point of view, what, what goes wrong or what can go wrong when those roles are blur? Obviously, there's a saying that I like very much that says, um, good fences make good neighbors. So mm -hmm. for as long as you don't encroach my, uh, into my territory, uh, then that neighborhood is likely to be very cordial. Mm -hmm. But having said that, um, the issue is very simple. As an executive, your role is to help implement strategy. Mm -hmm. But the responsibility for, say, the approval and setting the strategic tone sits with the board and vice versa. So the minute you start blurring those two lines, then you'll get one getting into another's territory. And then where does the accountability lie? And I always recommend that... Uh, your biggest tool in resolving all this is one, just making sure that you have a proper delegations of authority mm -hmm. and that says these matters are reserved for board. This is how far management can go. This is how much 
one can sign for. So the minute you have all these roles delineated in a very clear manner, then chances are that everybody will respect their lines of authority. And for the board, all they need to make sure of is that uh, they cannot abdicate their authority. Hence, a need for regular reporting and a level of oversight. And obviously, this is where issues of uh, information asymmetry comes in. As a board, you need to have sufficient information coming through mm -hmm. uh, without necessarily poking into operational issues. So the bottom line is everybody must be in their lane um, and make sure that there is synergy over what the two do, but just making sure that the board remains strategic mm -hmm. and management uh, operational while helping execute the strategy and decisions by the board. Mm -hmm. I think the one term that I've heard when it comes to board um, responsibility or accountability is the saying to say, the board must be nose in, fingers out. Mm -hmm. I never forget that one. <laughs> Um, just to, to move on, um, when, when we talk about governance, we always hear boards, companies, all these very intimidating words. Um, how can we actually implement good corporate governance in SMEs, for example? Is it, is it something that, should, that an SME should consider, or is it more reserved for the bigger um, companies with the bigger balance sheets and so on? Yeah, so that's exactly why so few organizations have bought into corporate governance because they think it's something for big corporates. Listed companies in Namibia have to either have NAM code or now since 2018 they can choose King 4. But when, when corporate governance is onerous, expensive, compliance based, most organizations just don't see the relevance of it unless it has to be done. So you end up with companies just going through NAM code, for example, 76 principles, mm -hmm. ticking them and explaining mm -hmm. what they haven't done and so on. And it's, it's a mechanical process. But if you flip across to, to outcomes-based governance, any organization can relate to that. And an SME can do it, a community fund can do it, a village council can do it, a school, a, a, a church council or whatever. They can all do it. Because you just take, in the case of King 4, four outcomes. Legitimacy. Mm -hmm. And you define, that's the first, you define what is legitimacy in your context. Your governing body, whatever it is, whatever type of organization, has to, of course, have legitimacy, has to be recognized as legitimate, and has to have the right diversity of skills, etc. on it. And you define that for your organization. The second one, ethical culture. I mean, that seems obvious. Uh, but it's not so obvious sometimes. Mm -hmm. So you, you really need to have people that are ethical and look at the best interests of that organization. That ethical culture, without that you go nowhere. You can have all the tick boxes, but you don't go anywhere. The second E, and, and the acronym here is LEAP, legitimacy, uh, ethical culture, mm -hmm. effective control. Esha referred to that. You've got to, and, and, and your your nice metaphor of nose in, fingers out is very important. The board must be in control, must know exactly what's going on, but must not interfere. But that effect of control has to be there. In a situation where you have a, what we used to call celebrity CEO, running the business and not telling the board what's going on, that's disastrous. Mm -hmm. Then that governing body does not have effective control. And, and it's going to fail. That organization is going to fail if it's being hijacked by, by, by executives. And the final one is performance. And it's not performance just in profit. It's performance in whatever context you define it as. The Community Cons Conservation Fund and the Conservancies, for example, one of their big performance indicators is how many rhinos have they saved? Mm -hmm. How many poachers have they, have they captured? And at the end of the day, they've got to balance their books somehow, so they've got to account for that. But their performance indicators might be saving rhinos or sightings of rhinos or whatever. And you define that per organization and the same, any SME, any medium-sized company, any micro company,
can define those four outcomes for themselves and then apply them and self self regulate. So it's not a question of auditing firms and com com compliance departments. Anybody can apply those outcomes uh, at their scale appropriately to their to their organisation. Um, Esha, um, does governance have a place in politics? Well, um, governance needs to have a place everywhere. Mm -hmm. There is a saying that um, you can govern an organization when you cannot self-govern. And uh, you can do a simple analogy of uh, how you govern yourself. Take a family, for instance. There is leadership within the family. There are those that are led. It's done for the sustainable benefits of specific family members. So in the same vein, whether it's in a political space, mm -hmm. when you look at the principles that you need to apply, they equally apply in a political space. A political party needs to be governed. When you go to the factors that Steve has spoken about, a, 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 a good political party must uh, be aligned to legitimacy. Uh, it needs to have a very strong and good ethical culture. It needs to have proper controls, otherwise the funds that it gets from the appropriation would otherwise not be accounted for. So, and it must perform because if you don't woo voters as a political party, then you have failed. So that simple analogy needs to be able to be brought into politics. And once you can do that, remember, Politicians carry the role of, for instance, in the SOE sector of uh, ownership. So how do you carry out the ownership function when you cannot um, appreciate governance? When it comes to the AGM, who carries out the ownership function? It's obviously the politician. So throughout the political ecosystem, you need to have sound governance principles for us to thrive. And there is a good analogy that has been drawn that um, corporate governance, as Steve has defined it, tends to thrive better in environments where political governance is sound. Mm. And just look at the countries where um, there is stable political systems. They tend to have a very mature national governance setup. So there is a strong place for politics to play, I mean, for governance to play in the political sphere. Yeah, see if, I could, if I can just come in there, I, you mentioned I serve on the National Governing Council of the mm -hmm. Africa Peer Review. Mm -hmm. I'm on that council. And we spent the whole of yesterday going through the first report that has been produced for Namibia. And it's a two-stage process. It's a self-assessment report and then an evaluation by an eminent persons group from Africa. So we spent the day trying to get a program of action out of that. And just to tell you of the structure of that, and again, this is incredibly modern thinking coming out of the African context. This is the African Union. Mm. And, and just to the governance, importance of governments right across the spectrum, there are four pillars in this particular self-assessment. The one is political and democratic governance, mm -hmm. where we assess ourselves and then our peers assess us on that. The other one is economic governance, the third one is corporate governance, and the fourth one is socio-economic governance. So it's governance of all those sectors, and we get then compared with uh, our, our peers in Africa, and there are 42 African countries now on this process. And you can see governance right across all the sectors. In our own national plans, in our NDPs, our HPPs, we talk about governance as a pillar and that's great. I mean, we've given great emphasis to it. But in the African peer review, it's governance of A, of B, of C, of D. Mm -hmm. So including political governance. So it, it's a very integrated way of looking at governance. I think that really talks to um, um, having to have also organizations in a country that are well run. And, and maybe just to extend on that yeah. and, and to actually ask Esha, mm -hmm. um, why is corporate governance important for development? Obviously, um, without governance, forget about sustainable economic development because there's just that nexus. 
and this is how you picture it. When you have well-run companies, for instance, mm -hmm. that filters to economic performance. When you have companies that, uh, maybe let me start here. The is sufficient research conducted by McKinsey a few years back that connected governance, I mean, um, financial performance to corporate governance. Gov uh, entities that f subscribe to sound uh, governance standards and principles tend to perform better financially. Obviously, that was during the age of uh, bottom line, but it still remains relevant. Mm -hmm. So once you have companies that are performing well in terms of governance, they tend to perform better in terms of uh, financial returns. And obviously, during the current um, setup, obviously, they need to perform better socially as well. And once that happens, that means they will be paying taxes. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, they would be contributing to your ESGs of this world, economic, I mean, environmental, social, and governance issues. And at the same time, you go beyond just organizations to comparative advantages of a nation. So in setups where governance is good at company level, it often goes all the way up to national development levels because what your companies do at micro level positively impacts what happens to your economy. Your GDP tends to grow when you have companies that are doing very well. So there is that good relationship between how well you govern your entities and how well your development uh, happens, both socially, economically, and otherwise. I think that also talks to um, I think investor confidence, um, where investors are actually more likely to invest in companies that are that are well run mm. steve from your banking um, experience can you, what can you share with us in in that regard yeah look banks are obviously profit driven but you're quite right the investors that invest in banking banking in other financial institutions and in fact in companies that are exploiting resources and so on want to see that those companies are sustainable, not just from a profit and returns point of view, mm -hmm. but from an integration into the society. Because if you, don't, if you don't integrate into society, and if you don't win all, all or most of the stakeholders over, you're not going to be sustainable. So I think investors more and more are not just looking at the pure returns, including in, in banks. Mm -hmm. There's a very interesting book called The Ethical Capitalists, How to Make Business Work Better for Society. And these are the sort of companies that investors want to invest in because this is a company in the UK, but they've for 30 years put a huge amount back into society. And we have this term that you do well by doing good. Mm -hmm. You don't go and make as much money as you can and then try and put some of it back, you know, because that often leads to artificial stuff. But this company has literally put in so much to society that it becomes a popular company and a well-recognized, uh, well-admired company and investors will invest in it. If a company, uh, including a bank or a financial institution, just goes out to ma maximize profits, investors will not necessarily invest in them especially in the context of ESG, which is becoming an absolute overriding requirement that you must address the environmental, the social governance issues in your company. Otherwise, investors will not even touch you. Mm. I think we've talked um, quite extensively on um, what is the ideal company, what is the ideal board, and how things should look. What, is, what does mm. bad governance look like in practice? Just to... Um, to contextualize that, Esha? The short answer is the opposite of what you've spoken <laughs> to. But obviously a bad governance would look as follows. Um, friction between shareholders and uh, the board. Uh, a very domineering chairperson. 
an organization uh, which um, doesn't uh, respect ethical values. I mean, if you don't have integrity permeating throughout your DNA, chances are that people will start taking shortcuts. They'll start paying uh, bribery in order to secure licenses. Mm -hmm. Obviously, and as you go down, then you have all these bad governance practices. Disclosure and transparency becomes an issue. People are no longer reporting, or where they report, it's window dressing. Uh, in issues of uh, governance, where they say, we do lots of ESG work, then it turns into greenwashing. Um, then it goes to management, not committed uh, management, people overriding delegations of authority framework, um, a culture of um, not accountability, reporting. And I mean, even in our society, without mentioning names, we've seen many of these examples where we go a number of years without reporting mm -hmm. and we we claim to be accountable. I mean, why are you in charge of an organization when you cannot account to mm -hmm. the stakeholder? And no mm -hmm. reason would uh, get you out of uh, non-compliance with some of these basics. So bad governance is where you don't tick any of these boxes, mm -hmm. both in um, word and uh, in deed. Uh, culture is another one where culture is very toxic. Uh, lack of leadership, the next leader comes, he leaves the organization in a worse position than he found it. So these are all tenets of bad governance. And I think for those that are leading organizations, it's time for us to look at ourselves in the mirror and say, am I meeting my obligations? Am I, uh, am I upholding the basic characteristics of good governance? Am I upholding the principles? Do I have the structures? Do I have the systems? And then move on to King 4 and look at the, those four variables. Are they existent in my system? Mm. If your answers are generally no's, then you should know that um, mm. it's potentially bad governance and it's never too late to fix it. I think uh, by way of somehow coming to a conclusion, I think I would like to hear from, from Steve, just in terms of your assessment of the Namibian um, corporate um, setup, how would you rate us, um, especially in view of the, um, the review that you, uh, that you attended yesterday? Yeah. Just in terms of um, our, whether it's a combination of SOEs, private companies, NGOs, hmm. um, where would you rate us compared to other African countries for that matter? All right, so... You know, it's, it's a typical response that we get in Namibia, um, the same response we got from the Africa Peer Review, that your governance frameworks, be it political, democratic, economic, social, etc., the governance frameworks are pretty solid. Okay. The implementation is not that mm -hmm. solid. And, and it's quite sobering to see that some countries which we've never regarded as being nearly at our level are in fact overtaking us in, in some respects. So we get a very good scorecard on, on paper, mm. but when the colleagues come here and they talk to people around the country, they find a mixed bag. And now I'll pass the, the buck to, to Mervyn King. Mervyn King, the guru of corporate governance, came here three years ago. And he met a hundred people, uh, generally senior executives and board members of state-owned companies. So 20 or so state-owned companies mm. were in the room. And he asked a lot of leading questions. And Patrick Chisanga, the, the Zambian corporate governance guru, guru, joined that session, asked a number of questions. And he said, I was asked to give you a litmus test on how government... How, what governance, governance is in Namibia. And he said, after three or four hours of, of asking all the right questions and so on, he said, my conclusion is that in general, your governance of SOEs is poor. You're not applying even the earlier governance principles, never mind King 4. His comment on private sector 
was it's very variable. You've got some great companies mm -hmm. and you've got some that are simply ticking boxes but not coming to, that, to those outcomes that you need to come to. So it's a mixed bag. But certainly our job at NICG is to go through and with those good examples, mm -hmm. go through and advocate better practice through an outcomes-based approach. And we, could, we can get there quite quickly if we, if we use the best as peers. And exactly as the country is doing in the Africa peer review, you can do that at a company or, or organization level as well. So it, it very, it's a very much a mixed bag now, mm -hmm. but it can improve quickly. So what, I, what I'm hearing from Steve is that we have systems in place we must actually just get to work and actually implement outcome-based um, um, results, basically in terms of our, um, our organizations. Uh, Esha, I think we've come to the end of our panel discussion. Any last words? Um, any words of um, wisdom that you would like to share with our viewers? Um, my last words is uh, governance is a journey and not a destination. It's a marathon and not a sprint. Um, and the better time to start is now. From the few organizations that I have mingled with, either as advisor or where I've served on boards, what you find is a um, sense of very good ambition, but like Steve has indicated, execution and getting it done. But maybe one other item that we need to look at is how much are we willing to invest in making sure that we upscale our governance? Mm. It pains me a lot when I look at, for instance, our SOE sector, where you just stretch your poor governance support, where you don't invest in basic fundamental training for your board members. Get these people to attend courses send them on um, study visits. Also, just make sure that you get your ecosystems right. You don't need 20 policies on governance mm. to get things right. Start testing your governance maturity level to see how far you've come. Start evaluating your board, start conducting board effectiveness assessments and invest slightly more to empower poor governance, support stuff. I think that is where the private sector is beating us. Mm -hmm. You would go to a private sector entity, say a bank, and in their governance department, they have three people. So they are able to focus on advisory, mm -hmm. setting up governance systems, do, uh, facilitating board evaluations, and doing all sorts of things. And the poor, overworked fellow there their task becomes to make sure that they finalize minutes and work towards the next meeting. Mm -hmm. So I think if we adopt a very proactive approach towards growing our governance both at micro and micro level, and one is happy that you have an institution like the NICG, uh, which going forward will definitely start doing more, with better institutionalization, I'm sure we can go our national governance levels beyond where it is now. Um, yeah, I think that's it from my angle. And uh, yeah. all I'm saying, our situation is not bad. Mm -hmm. We can do better. And once we do better, we will be amongst the best. Mm -hmm. um, Steve, you have anything else to add in terms of um, Asia's conclusion? Just yeah, last so words from you. So, Ernestine, Esh has handed over the institution <laughs> yes. to us and, and he really has set a very mm -hmm. high standard in, in co corporate governance and in, in best practice. And it's our job to really democratize corporate governance throughout Namibia uh, and take it to the next level. And I, I'd, I'd just like to say that one should not underestimate what impact individuals can have. Mm -hmm. And we have individual membership and we have corporate membership and then we have our sort of major corporates. And we really are encouraging passionate corporate governance practitioners, even if you only have five years experience in, in the field, but you're passionate about it, 
join as an individual because we've seen how individuals can take companies mm. to a different level. One individual can change the modus operandi of a company if they're passionate about it and if they are those ethical leaders that, that we need. I want to just leave with a, another reference to a book. And, and this is the gentleman Bonang Mohali, mm -hmm. who is head of business leadership South Africa. And this is a gentleman who's come from a rural setting, gone through corporate life, been extremely successful, and now plays a role as a, as a motivational speaker and as a thought, a thought leader. And his book is called Lift As You Rise. Mm -hmm. You have no idea how much you can take people with you a good organization, can, good organization can take other organizations with them. And if we do that, if we have these exceptional individuals in organizations that are average or, or even below average, we can lift the level of corporate governance quite quickly. Mm -hmm. And we can really take it to all organizations in the country. We can't do it alone as NICG, mm -hmm. but with those ambassadors and custodians of corporate governance and, and good ethical practice, we can lift the bar very quickly so that the next Africa peer review comes and says, you are magnificent. <laughs> <laughs> you are executing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you very much, Esha and Steve. I think we really did justice to the topic um, in answering, does governance matter? I don't think I'll do justice by summarizing. I think you, you are quite clear in terms of what we need to do, what is best practice. So it's really just for um, our viewers to um, hopefully have taken, um, learned one or two things for, from our discussion. And I would like to then formally thank you for um, availing your time. I would like to thank our viewers for making time to, to join us for this conversation. And I would like to implore them to, to join, um, actually be on the lookout for our next program so they can join and actually learn more about governance. Thank you very much and good night. Thank you very much, Asti. Thank you, Austin, and uh, good night for our viewers.